Hi, everyone. This is E. David Crawford, Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Urology. Joining me is Dr. Fernando Bianco, who is Investigator-in-Chief for the Urologic Research Network in Miami. Fernando did a fellowship in urologic oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering, then moved on to George Washington University and in 2008 to South Florida. Well, there he's done a lot of innovative things and he's gonna share with us a program called Focal Waves. And I had the opportunity to visit with Fernando a couple of years ago and see this in action. And I've asked him to share it with our audience right now. Fernando, thanks for being with us and look forward to your uh, discussion. So I wanna thank Dr. Crawford for the opportunity to do uh, the grand rounds in urology and today. Uh, that, he's ha uh, that I have to discuss our program on MR fusion um, in prostate cancer. So these are some of my disclosures and conflict of interest. People can read it. And just to get started, where were we at the year 2000? Well, back then, if we think about in terms of Blockbuster and Netflix, and this is a slide that Andrew Stevenson, a good friend, provided to me, right? We were after, by the time I was graduating from my residency program, we were after open prostatectomy. That was like the, you know, you wanted to be a good prostatectomy, specifically if you were, were going to be like a urologic oncologist, but robotics and laparoscopy was coming in the works. And that became the new disruption. And it was, it was being held back because it was more expensive and had some devastating complications in the beginning. The procedure was perceived to be long, but with the robot, a lot of that was bypassed. However, Back then, we were also waiting for the data, the first data from the Scandinavian trial or the PIVOT trial, and then what subsequently was the PROTECT trial. So there was a lot of enthusiasm on this study. And what happens just over the last 10 years? Well, the, SP, the SPCG, uh, the Scandinavian trial done and conducted mostly in the pre-PSA era, showed that there was no benefits in survival and overall survival. And if anything, though, over a course of 23 years and with more than 75% of people dead already, the benefit in terms of quantity of life associated with surgery could be quantified in 2.9 years. If we go to pivot with almost 70% death, death events rates and 20 years of follow-up, we can see that the legacy of the trial is that surgery may have given you one year of life, no real predictors here, and three times the rates of incontinence associated with those who have surgery, and twice the erectile dysfunction, however, with the caveat that the observation group was, was very poor in terms of erections, as many of them had it at the beginning of the trial. And then the PROTECT trial that came out of the United Kingdom, basically what revealed that the active monitoring group, a lot of them underwent conversion, and there was no difference even when you added the radiation arm. So by 2012, I was wondering myself and asking myself what I was doing with my patients and what was that I really wanted to do was the bigger question, how they really wanted to help them. And uh, having trained in Memorial under Peter Scardino and Heidi Resack in radiology and organizing all this conference allowed me the opportunity to really learn how to read MRIs. And I thought, well, if we can pinpoint these lesions, maybe we can go and treat those lesions. And that could be an answer, get specific on the lesions in the prostate without taking the whole organ and without basically altering the anatomy that we know has some uh, adverse events. So, in that sense, I wrote up a protocol back in 2013 just to, uh, to understand what were the outcomes after we started a fusion program. So having knowledge with MRI and the software that was coming out that allowed this fusion, we could go ahead and try to target treat uh, this patient. So the emphasis of the program will be in safety and local control, as well as quality of life issues. And we wanted to have a longitudinal assessment that will be tracked for decades. Okay, so basically the eligibility is on the slide and we will evaluate a series of issues. The next question was, as we did the first pilot patients in the ambulatory, whether we could take it to the office. And then the question was whether sedation or anesthesia was really needed. And that led us to think about stuff on how to block the perineum. In the process of this, as we were accomplishing this, we got prestigious visitors just like Dr. Crawford, Dr. Franz Brun, and others, Dr. Emberton, uh, Dr. Hugh, eventually, who, 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 who started with us in the program as well. 
And we started looking into all these uh, issues that I'm going to show you as the next that led me to first um, uh, apply for a patent in terms of how to on a method on how to block the perineum in order to do these procedures in the office setting under local anesthesia. And then the next challenge that was felt was, well, if we do an effusion program, are we going to be the super docs? And if, if, if this depends on a super docs, in other words, the doctor is doing the MRI analysis, the contouring or the segmentation, and then you have to plan up for the biopsy and plan up for the treatment and do all these things. You cannot really have time then to take care of patients. So trying to do it all together was, was nonsensical. So we thought more into an outsource model where we can have third parties basically do a lot of the process and take care of the logistics so we can focus as urologists and on what matters most to us, which is taking care of our patients and not the noise in the background that's needed. However, the, the, the program evolved. And then by, by 2019, we had the ability to... Um, to work with the University College of London and basically uh, um, it started using a medical device that had originally uh, been developed in the UK and then we repatriated to the United States where we've been manufacturing now for the last two years where that provides what we call a deformable fusion and this is the Focalix fusion device. And all this is integrated with an app where we can keep that longitudinal assessment of patient outcomes where people really fit this app. So the data for the Fusion uh, platform came out of the picture trial that was uh, ran in the UK between 2014 and, 20, uh, and 2016, and where they had about 200 uh, patients that completed MR Fusion target, where they had a, a mean sample of, uh, uh, of, of three biopsy samples and compared with a transperineal saturation biopsy of 48 samples. And they found that using real-time fusion, they could pinpoint uh, accuracy in 74% of the cases just by taking three samples. So if the number of samples increase, then the number of positive biopsies um, will go up as well, or, or the negative predictive value will drop as well. So that led us into this whole Focalix fusion program that we basically are continuing to push over the years, and I'll tell you more. So we focus on the biopsy in which we use an ultrasound machine and it's agnostic to the type of machine. And then we use a stepper that helps us stabilize the probe so we can conduct the, the, the procedures as I will show in real-time fusion. And the same went with therapy. Then we add up the cryoablation uh, needle probes or V probes uh, depending on the on the manufacturer, and uh, and now we're also advancing into laser technology to use transperineal laser. So the program workflow uh, goes by starts at where the physician evaluates the patient and orders an MRI, and this provides uh, a whole set of diagnoses that go into the background. The images are acquired, they're processed, and the next encounter that and there's a flow that allows. The, the, this company to tell us where is each patient at, at given stage who has had his planning done, where's the biopsy going to happen. And then the next encounter of the urologist with the patient is the moment that the transperineal biopsy is being conducted, let's say in the office, as is shown in this brief video, where we take in pinpoint precision samples. So we have a GPS of the prostate. And if they're positive, then we can go ahead and assess not just the pathology, their location, their quantity, and opens the door for fusion therapy. In this particular case, you can see the yellow dots represent the positive biopsy course that came from the green uh, samples taken. And everything gets digitalized in an app that patients have access to as well as their physicians and the centers where they are being done. So in this particular situation, I'll show you for treatment, it's a 55 year old Caucasian who had a prostate cancer of three plus four on that right side. And you, we can see the exact areas that those tumor was. So then the, the treatment again is modeled now using algorithms that have been developed over hundreds of patients over the last uh, eight years. And this shows clearly how diffusion takes place. It's essentially the MRI is already in the fusion platform. And then we do a uh, segmentation of the ultrasound 
or, or we take the volume of the prostate and then we essentially tell the system, where are the dots that represent the prostate in the ultrasound? So the system will do the blend between the, what we are telling them is the boundaries of the ultrasound, the apex and the base, and then the, uh, the borders of the prostate with the already loaded MRI that has the plan, either a treatment plan or a biopsy plan as shown here. And then this takes us to a real-time fusion where we can then play into really hitting the target as it's gonna show here. So once we, once we have completed the fusion, we go into a live mode. And in that live mode, we can see the areas that we want to ablate as well as the entire surface of the prostate, the context with the urethra and the boundaries of these areas. And also will tell us, and this will show on the left, uh, on the, on the, in the left corner here of the screen, where are the coordinates that we should use on the grid so we can hit the dots that we want or the spots that we want to um, use to destroy like it shows in this video. So in this case, we are going to advance a rod, uh, uh, one of those cryo probes, and we can see how it goes with pinpoint precision to where we wanna be. And one of the advantages of doing the blend between the MR and the ultrasound or the fusion is that as we start the, the, the treatment process, right, we can have a um, perspective of how is our treatment going and the perspective with the overall gland, which sometimes gets, um, gets confused when you're doing it just on the on ultrasound without using MRI a fusion. You see the area of the process is ablated, but sometimes with the changes, it can get a little bit more confusing. And what's the typical response that we have seen in patients? We see a drop in PSA. Uh, it was roughly 75%. There's an improvement in urinary function as well as, in, as, uh, um, as no major deterioration in erectile function. So from a quality of, uh, of life perspective, the treatment accomplished its goals. So what has happened? Well, we currently are doing this uh, uh, program we have been able to replicate it in the city of New York and Boston and also in Madrid, uh, as well as here in Miami. And we have been able to do about 2,600 of this biopsies over the last eight years, as well as over a thousand procedures. This information that we've been collected has allowed us to uh, analyze and also run alternative uh, sets, some, some uh, statistical techniques actually taught to to me by Dr. Andrew Vickers, in which, for example, we try to quest, we try to answer the question whether are antibiotics necessary before a biopsy. And this is basically what we're going to be presenting at the AUA this year, in which about 40% of that cohort who have had a transperineal biopsy has not been treated with antibiotics. And the responses are exactly the same as those treated with antibiotics. No infection, really no difference of any kind in uh, any of the major outcomes. Uh, the major side effects after transperineal biopsy, the most common by far will be urinary retention and an eventual, um, could have eventual urethral bleeding if the urethra is sampled, but most of these patients are really uh, do quite well. When we look now at uh, 529 patients that we have reviewed who had had the transperineal biopsy, transperineal, cryoablation, and where, uh, and many of them had a transperineal biopsy a year later, we can see the following. The median age of the cohort is about 70 years with a median PSA of 5.2, as shown there, about two years of follow-up. Importantly, out of those 529 patients, 369 of them had, um, had at least a year of follow-up, so we had offered a biopsy. The biopsy was compulsory before 2019, uh, and we were able to get in roughly 75% of the patient. After that, it got adjusted based on some data I'll show you in a second. But 264 had done that biopsy and 31% of them or 83 patients have been positive. And one of the things that we, uh, after looking into many things, including leeson grades and stage and PSA and PSA density, and none of that really correlated with a positive biopsy at a year. What has is the MR we do at a year where we judge using the PIRATS, 
okay, the tissue that was not treated, and then the tissue that was treated is just basically on enhancement and non-enhancement. And for those who had a pyrats one or two, only 6% of them has shown a positive biopsy, whereas those who had a pyrats of four or five and the one year MR, have 74% uh, of them have a positive biopsy. So right now we're not routinely biopsying people who have a pyrats one to two on that year MRI and whose PSA is stable. What about conversion to radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy? And surprisingly to us, really the conversions rate have been very low. And we did have some in the beginning of the program because we didn't know much, but I tell you, uh, overall, we have 18 patients who have been converted to surgery, and I've done 14 of those cases. And the cancer volumes in 11 of those 14 were less than 10%. So that's one of the reasons we have now more people who ask us uh, to, if when they have a recurrence, if they can be retreated. And the retreatment rate is about 16%. What about functional outcomes? So with in a cohort that we analyzed late last year of 525 men, uh, with at least six months of follow-up, we could see that we had no incontinence, no really, no climacteria, no GI adverse events. 74% of patients reported improvement in urinary function with IPSS dropping a mean of six points. And 78% of patients had returned erections to baseline by three months with 70% of them keeping their ejaculation. And those numbers increased in six months to 85 and 75% respectively. So what's the case for partial gland ablation? Well, in general, we feel that the tumor is the, the main driver, the, the dominant tumor is the main driver of aggressiveness, and that's the easiest one to treat. With cryoablation, the way we do it targeted, we can address the multifocality. And then the MRI help us identify the lesion that we corroborated with biopsies. Energy devices like cryo or HIFU, IRE, or laser, I think we'll go. We'll grow into this setting as the adverse event pro profile of them, when dotted, are done or conducted in this way, are very limited. So the way I see it is that in between that black and white of active surveillance or radical management, there is a big gray area where partial gland ablation will have perhaps is nidus, and it's about preserving quality of life without really burning any bridges. So what do I tell patients? So I discuss the randomized data, I discuss surveillance, and I discuss that we have treated now over a thousand men. And I tell them that I'm confident that the tumors will be destroyed, and that I'm confident that we're not burning any bridges, so we have radiation and surgery in our pockets. I'm very confident that quality of life is going to improve, so it's not about a trifecta or which one is going to limit, no. The actual urinary function of this patient's improved. And I'm very confident that they will return to their use of activities within a week after the catheter is out. But I stress that the cancer may come back. And if it, so, so we have to keep following just like we do our patients, we, we do surgery or we do surveillance or we radiate. And that at one year, the MRI is really mandatory and needed. And depending on that MRI, we will most likely do a biopsy or favor the performance of a biopsy. So how do we see it now? Well, right now, robotic prostatectomy seems to be the blockbuster of the day, and the Netflix of the day is going to be focal therapy because it can be done in the office with minimal comorbidity, with minimal morbidities. It really doesn't do much harm to patients and does a lot, how to, a lot of good. And I want to uh, thank you all for having the opportunity to present this information, especially to Dr. Crawford and his wonderful group. Fernanda, thanks for sharing this with our audience. Uh, this clearly is innovative. There's a lot of direction right now uh, in things other than radical prostatectomy and, and whole gland radiation and the targeted focal therapy is, is certainly uh, gaining a lot of stronghold. This is uh, another way to look at it and to implement this, uh, this exciting new uh, diagnostic and therapeutic uh, regimen.